pick those horses. <laughs> but they seem like nice horses. So, today's talk is going to be about interactive prototyping. But I thought maybe instead of the talk being about interactive prototyping, what if the talk was an interactive prototype? There's, there's no way that could go wrong. <laughs> Um, so that is why I asked you to do this crazy thing and download a link and create an account. So hopefully you've had a chance to do that. There's a link again if you need it. There's this little button at the top right that you need to make an account if you haven't. Uh, don't feel obliged if you don't want to. I understand that you may not want to make an account. That's absolutely fine. It's just for a bit of fun and nonsense. Um, but none of the buttons will work unless you make an account. So please do make an account if you can. Um, and I wanted to talk about prototyping today because it's been a lot of what my career has involved. So I make games, I make all kinds of games, here's a few of them here. Uh, I've most recently been making a lot of puzzle games. Um, I was uh, head of product uh, development at a mobile studio called Two Dots, uh, which some folks might know. I've also made a lot of narrative games, often games um, connected with movie franchises, so games for the Bond universe and for the Sherlock Holmes universe. Um, a lot of kids and educational games. Uh, I've also made uh, physical tabletop real world games, um, stuff that you play uh, not on a screen but in the real world. Um, I've been a design consultant uh, on the AAA side uh, on some uh, action console titles. And like uh, any uh, working game designer, I know that we have some people from the games field in the audience today. I have made literally hundreds of other games that never saw the light of day. So what is very, very common in the games industry is um, that you will maybe uh, ideate or prototype or start to build out maybe as many as a hundred games for everyone that actually makes it out the door at the other end. Uh, some don't get much further than a bit of paper, some get a long way towards being released. Um, so I have done a huge amount of prototyping in my career which has been a little bit tricky because while I am a game designer, I'm not a game developer. It was a little bit of a tactical oversight I made early on. So uh, I work a lot with uh, engineers. Uh, my co-founder at Cadre Systems, also here tonight, is a very experienced developer, but I am not. Um, so I have had to uh, kind of pull together a whole bunch of different ways to test out interactive ideas um, in a, in a no or a low code environment to get a feel for what I'm So I'm going to give you a, a lightning tour of all of those uh, in this talk. So that, now you know a little bit about me, I don't yet know anything about you, which doesn't seem fair. So what I'm hoping, look what you did it already, you lovely people. Uh, if you have logged into the app, you've got some buttons that you can press. Uh, you can keep pressing them right now if you want to. Everyone hates balsamic. That's the main thing that you learn from this screen. Um, but uh, we've got, oh, how many cool people? We've got five cool people. Thanks, thanks for spreading your coolness. I appreciate it. Uh, we do have a few folks from here from games. Um, but the bulk of the, pe the bulk of people that we have reading tapping, fair enough. It's a pretty good place downstairs if you're in the mood for that. Um, oh, this is very interesting. So we have some people prototype, we have people making interactives with Mid Journey. Uh, little chat GPT is happening. A lot of people in Unity, that makes sense. A lot of people in Figma, that makes sense. Uh, Google Drive, which I'm, is maybe my typo, but I assume it will meaning Google Sheets, Google Slides, Google all the things. Um, and so this is all happening via the magic of Coda, which I'll be talking about a little bit more. Um, this is maybe not that impressive if you're a developer who's good at making websites, but if you're somebody who, who can't do computer very well. This is a very big deal that I'm getting this to work. Um, and I really love that these kind of tools are becoming available that are making it possible for me to build these kind of interactive digital tools um, with kind of uh, a, a, a very different technical approach than if I was trying to do it in a normal development environment. You guys are still going, I love this. Oh, some JavaScript is a good choice. Pen and paper, I'd like to remember pen and paper, we're talking about that. Uh, so, before we get into some of the systems, I just wanted to talk a little bit about why I prototype and why I think it's valuable. Um, if you work in games, you 
may spend some of your time talking about this thing called the core loop, uh, which is the fundamental uh, kind of set of actions that a player does over and over in a game. I think there is a core loop at the bottom of every single interactive experience, and I think this is what that loop is. It goes from see to know to want to do. So what you can see on screen gives you information, changes the knowledge that you have. The knowledge that you have drives your desires about what you want. What you want helps you decide the thing that you're going to do next to try and get what you want, and then the screen is going to update and show you the result of that action that you tried. Now, if you're making a video game, you're maybe going through that loop every 60 times a second, maybe, um, because every single frame you need new information. Maybe the, 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 the new knowledge that you're getting is that a rocket is coming straight from your head, so the thing that you want to do is get the hell out of the way, and so what you're going to do is push the stick left, and then the screen is going to update and let you know whether or not you've got hit. If you're making an e-commerce app, or a, a browser-based design tool, or something else, you're going to be running through that loop much more slowly, I, I hope, than 60 times a second. Um, but I think the loop is still there in pretty much any interactive product. Uh, but what I think is interesting about it is that, as a designer, you're only in charge of half of it. You're very much in charge of the community thing. You're very much in charge of what the person sees. And that means you're a bit in charge of what they know, because you're giving them um, a bunch of information. But you're not completely in charge of that. They already know stuff. Uh, they've played other games, they've used other apps, they have other ideas. So you have some influence, but not um, the, the full control there. You're not at all in charge of what they want. That's all that they're going to feel things here or here or wherever it is you feel the things that you want and, and make decisions based on it. And then again, you're a little in charge of what they do because you're going to um, give them the interaction options that they have, but you don't get to control their choices or their timing. And so if you're not prototyping interactively, you're only getting half the picture. You're flying blind on that half of the loop that is inside your player or your user's head. And so that's how I use prototyping, is as early as possible in the process, uh, I want to get access to the other half of that picture. And what's cool is, if you know that that's what you're chasing, that you're chasing access to that loop, you start to realize that you can prototype with almost anything. Uh, so my favorite thing to prototype with uh, is nothing. It's my favorite prototyping tool, nothing. Um, more sensible people call this verbal prototyping, but I think that lacks a little bit of mystery, so I call it invisible prototyping. Uh, and this is something that you just do uh, with uh, your mouth and your ears and your brain. Um, so there's some, if you've got the link open, there's some fuller information about how I tend to do it there. Um, but the simple idea is this is something that often works best in pairs. One of you plays the role of the game or the app. One of you plays the role of the user or the player. And together you just step through this loop over and over. The person who is being the game or being the app explains what is visible on screen. The person who's the player vocalizes what they now think they know about what's happening, what it is that they want to do next, and the action that they're going to take to try and get what they want. And then the person who's playing the game or the app tells them what the screen now shows in relation to that. Um, it sounds a little clunky, but the truth is it's most valuable if you really rigorously try and stick with that loop. When it starts to be a bit less useful is when it devolves into a brainstorm about feature ideas, which is always a little tempting if you're talking to someone who's on your project. But if you stick with it and really try and go through that a few times, um, it's amazing the insights that you can get out of it. The other thing that's cool about it is that it's free and instant. Uh, and nothing else I've got for you today is free and instant. It's a rare, wonderful combination. Um, so uh, I think it's a, it's a super valuable and easily overlooked tool, partly because it's invisible. So a quick way to enrich that is to start to bring in the physical world a little bit. So somebody uh, mentioned pen and paper uh, in the little survey that we did. Um, I do a lot of early work uh, on post-it notes or bits of card or uh, wherever else. Um, and the real world is full of objects that are incredibly good shortcuts for things that you often need in the game or an app. Uh, it's much quicker to set a timer on your phone than it is to build one into an interactive experience that you're prototyping in another environment. 
uh, if you need a buzzer, it's much quicker to pull one out of the drawer than figure out how to build a button into the thing that you're making. Um, my favorite one here uh, is this guy. This is a great prototyping tool. Uh, if you want to get really honest feedback, uh, start charging people to press your buttons. Um, because then they'll stop smoke, blowing smoke up your ass, I can tell you. It's a very, very quick way to just ask people to put their hands in their pockets uh, and put a 100 yen coin in your pot or whatever uh, to find out what they really think. So this definitely leans a little bit more in the game um, direction. Uh, but if you're not working games, I think you might find it interesting to think a little bit just about what objects you have around you that would let you get going with an idea very quickly. These pair really well with verbal prototyping or digital prototyping, you can kind of mix and match really effectively. Um, and also it's nice, it's a nice excuse to go shopping in Daiso for things in rainbow colors. So I recommend you guys Oh, blank dice, awesomely useful. You can write what you want on the side. Uh, very good for randomizing uh, the outcomes of, or the player choices that you kind of want to test. Blank playing cards, also will be. A step up from that is a thing uh, I, Call, I don't know if anyone else has a name for it, parasitic prototyping. So I first started using this when I was working in tabletop. Um, if you're making physical games, often the quickest way to get going is just to grab some other games off the shelf and raid them for the parts that you need to try out your own game. So this was a mobile board game I was prototyping uh, that we just prototyped real fast on a uh, travel scrabble board because it was quicker than, was literally quicker than drawing a grid or printing a grid on a piece of paper. Um, this obviously works great for board games. Does it work for digital? I think it does. This is how I do it. Uh, it's kind of goofy, but it's also kind of awesome. I draw on my screen with whiteboard pen. Um, please make sure your phone can handle this before you do it and ruin your phone. Um, but if I have an idea for a thing, this is a, a Hiragana learning app, which some of you may use, it's a pretty good one. Um, if I have an idea for something, what I'll often do is I'll go and find an app or a game that is a bit like the thing that I'm thinking about, and then doodle my own ideas on top of it. And what's great about that is you have an interactable app underneath it, you can start to get a feel for what you learn about having different bits of information at different times, different bits of feedback. So this is me starting to wonder, oh, this is kind of fun, but would it be more fun if I was getting experience points? What would it be like if I had power-ups? Could I start to build a street system in here in a way that's different? So it's not anywhere close to the real thing, but again, takes five minutes and gives you an insight that you wouldn't get any other way. So, also a big fan of parasitic, parasitic tools. Also gives you an excuse to use the vampire emoji, which otherwise doesn't see uh, a lot of use. It doesn't see the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that sucks. Oh! 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 Twine spoiler, let me fix that. Um, most of us sit at our laptops all day, maybe all of us sit at our laptops all day, so I thought you would probably mostly want to know about digital tools. Uh, if you're a game designer, you spend a weirdly enormous amount of time in spreadsheets. Um, and Excel is, is maybe sort of the single most powerful piece of software ever made. It runs this whole gamut from kind of just being a very organized whiteboard right through to being this bizarre but very powerful coding environment that you can build Quake in if you would like to. Don't, but you can. Um, and so this is an example of how uh, I sometimes use it kind of more at the whiteboard end. So this is a prototype of the crafting system for an RPG. So a lot of this is just information, organization, these are all the kinds of things that you can get in this crafting system. This is uh, their um, properties and powers. Uh, this is where you find them in the game and how quickly you get them. And then this very, very simplistic system just lets you play through a set of turns and activities in the game. You plot out, this is where the player goes, this is what they do, this is what they want to craft. This works really well as a companion to verbal prototyping. And then you can pull information through from the other tabs uh, that help you keep track of now what do they have in their inventory, how many resources they have left, does it feel like they're unlocking the skill at the right time, would it be more fun if they could go here before they go there. Uh, it's pretty manual, um, but uh, 
again, much, much quicker than building out all of this in a real game environment uh, before you figure it out. This is, sadly in the screenshot, uh, an example of two other interesting things about spreadsheets. So this is a much more automated version of that. Um, this is modeling uh, a combat system. Uh, and the reason there's so many numbers on there is uh, the sheet is randomly generating within a set of parameters a whole bunch of uh, individual encounters uh, with kind of like different uh, character classes and starting stats and then figuring out the outcome of all of them. This, however, illustrates the other very important thing about spreadsheets, uh, which is they're super good for game designers, and they are a nightmare for anyone else. This is a very, very indigestible document to share with anything else. It's very hard to explain. To share with anyone else, it's very hard to explain what's going on. Uh, it's actually pretty horrible to go back to after two months of not working on that project when you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> what was any of this? How does any work? It also requires you to learn that you can see it starting to peak out at the top, an amount of quite unpleasant um, uh, Excel, I still always call it Excel, Google Sheets uh, formula writing, which is not always a very fun environment to be in. So more recently, I have been using uh, a tool called Machinations. Has anyone encountered Machinations? Weird name. Much prettier, right? Who would rather be looking at that? Um, so Machinations is a very game-specific prototyping tool. Uh, but I think it does have some applications for uh, especially kind of like thinking about experience flow and funnel planning and those kind of things if you're more on the app side. So what's happening here is, this is the simplest model of a game that I could make. There's a player on the left, every time a dot goes through the diagram, that's simulating one playthrough. In this video game there is one fight against the red monster. You have a 50-50 chance of winning that fight. Uh, and if you win, you go up and you get treasure, and if you lose, you go down and you die. And so that is everything that happens in that game. Um, so we're not learning much from this diagram because it's the world's simplest game. You know if there's one fight and there's a 50-50 chance, you don't need a diagram to figure out what's gonna happen. Um, but the minute you're working with something more sophisticated, no, sorry, this is gonna have to load now, um, there's a lot more that you can do. So this is a kind of like, uh, expanded version of that same idea. Uh, and oh, I have to slow it down. It's going to slow down a bit more. Oh, good. Um, so, oh look, I'm going to go hands free. I can do this. We have a slightly similar thing happening here. You can see the ball is coming along. This is a series of game uh, encounters, like game levels. They're getting progressively harder. This is losing. You'll see right now our guy is mostly losing. So this is simulating kind of a free-to-play roguelike. So guys now run out of energy, so everything stopped happening. He's going to have to wait for his energy to recharge the next day. It will happen eventually, or it won't, because this stuff is hard. Hang on. I'll press, I'll press the button again. Oh, it's like, hey, look at it, it worked, it worked. Got one. <laughs> um, up here, we're keeping track of all kinds of things. This is the number of times he's played, number of times he's lost, uh, money that he spent, power ups that he's bought, new equipment that he's owned. Um, and this is super duper tunable. Um, this model that I've got here, actually you can use this toggle up here uh, to flip between a paying player and a non-paying player um, to give you a sense of how quickly somebody can move through the game if they're not buying any extras versus if they are, help you understand how your overall economy is running. This would be a nightmare to put together in Excel, but is actually pretty legible and uh, fun to tweak. Oh, he's got a win, he's got a win, he's got one win. Um, and how this works. So this is super fun. It's probably not a thing that you're going to use unless you're a pretty serious game maker, but I thought you might get a kick out of seeing it. Uh, and if anyone wants to talk about it at length after the talk, I'd be very happy to. It's pretty cool if you're a games person. Um, what might surprisingly be more relevant is this thing, Twine. Anybody here working in Twine ever? Oh, I get a big nod for Twine. So Twine is mostly known as an environment to make uh, te uh, text-based adventures, so, so graphically very, very simple, literally simple, just hypertext style uh, text games uh, that you move through uh, via a series of links. Um, I actually find it incredibly useful as a lightning fast content planner. Uh, so what's nice about it is that it's a very, very quick environment to work in, and it gives you instant access to both this kind of diagram view, but also instantly um, a clickable uh, web-based view. 
Um, so you can move backwards and forwards, you can go to the register link, you can go to the register link to the edit screen. Um, this obviously looks very bland. Uh, that's one of my favorite things about it, because this is an environment where it is impossible to get distracted worrying about how things should look or what your layout should be. This is just about the discipline of saying, what information do I need where, and what are the connections between those pieces of information, how should I move between them. Um, it's super, super quick. So let's say here I've got, this is, I don't know I'm working, yeah. So this is my registration page. Right now, once you've registered, I'm taking you straight, I'm imagining this is kind of a design, web-based design app. Once you've registered, this is gonna take you straight to the edit screen. Now I'm thinking maybe there should be a tutorial. So let's take that out. Just remember how to spell tutorial. That's now just there. And then I can take that and weld it straight on to the edit screen. Knows that I want that. And now, as quick as that, I've got this new screen. I've got this new part of the diagram, and then I can jump into the live version, and that will be updated. And so I've used this both for kind of like planning site-based content and flows, it's very, very quick for doing that. But I've also used it in games, I used this last year on a, a game project, which was a big 3D immersive project, very, very visually heavy, lots of questions about how environments should fit together and how the story should weave through the environment, and the team was getting really kind of overwhelmed trying to juggle all of this. And I got them to put the main game to one side for a little while and just build it in twine, just with these summaries of what was happening in which place and they found that they were actually able to answer a lot of their creative questions there by playing through that and then come back to the full game and work that through afterwards. So um, Twine also has a super high skill ceiling if you want to get serious about using it. There's all kinds of wonderful stuff you can pull off with it, but it takes 20 seconds to get started in it. Uh, also free to use, so it's a tool I like a lot. Coda uh, is where we've been hanging out. Uh, anyone here using Coda? Uh, people sometimes describe it as a competitor to Notion, but I think it's much, much more super powered than that. Uh, Notion is wonderful, but uh, I think this does a little bit more. So there's a lot of things, I, a lot of good things I like about it, creative and technical. Lots of good things is a bit, a little bit vague. Uh, so let's get rid of lots and start getting specific. So I think maybe there's like 45 good technical things about it and 60, 67 good creative things about it. So now I've got this number here that just lives as part of that text. Margaret, I'm going to have you twitch just a little bit. <laughs> I can't promise not to break into zone at some point. Do it right now. I'm gonna... <laughs> That's a point. Uh, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is my equivalent of singing. Writing code up from this is my equivalent of singing. Uh, so let's call this good things. Uh, and so now, Said that there's 33,015 good things. I've told you what one of them is, it can do maths. What about the other 314? That's how that works, and you would expect I can do more than that. So let's call, but maybe I'm going to change my mind about how many good things there are about Coda. So we can put in a slider, which for some reason is not the page. There we go. Let's call the slider creative. Now this is a slider that changes value. Let's go and tell this guy that he should reference that. And then this works. That's pretty cool. And then this, this number up here is updating correctly too. But uh, maybe what I think doesn't matter. Maybe you have opinions about how many cool things there are. So let's put a button in here. Let's get this button uh, to Set this control value. We're going to get it to target this creative slider that I just made. Uh, we want it to add one to the total, so we can increment the total. So let's say let's take the creative value and add one to it. And just because it's nice, 
to stay more what? more creative. And then this goes up. That's cool. But what goes up? Must come down. Sorry, one second. This, I should say, is not the scariest thing I have to do in this present day. Let's go with minus one. Let's, because we're not monsters, call it fewer creative. Now this goes down. That's cool. What's really cool is now if I grab these buttons. And this, this is what you're all looking at, and I think, oh hang on, let's press that button, but you're up to the top of your page, so you might want to scroll back to the top of your page, you now got those buttons on your page, do you? <laughs> Can you make a number go up? Make a number go up! Oh, you're not doing that thing. Make a number go up. Here it is. Whoa, you make it go up so much. Oh, some people are making it go <laughs> Okay, so that was a very, very dumb, quick explanation of what working in code is like, but I thought it might be interesting to see how it goes together. So, it's kind of a little bit code adjacent. If you're coming to code as something you can program, there's going to be a lot of things here that are familiar to you. But if you're not a programmer, I think it's a very, very easy on-ramp to get some of these things working. I'm going to take that off your screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's uh, a little tool I'm going to bring back to work and back in a minute. Uh, this is a little problem solver. I don't know if anyone else runs into this problem all the time. But, hmm? uh, but this, uh, helps you solve the problem of you have a sum of money in, let's say, dollars that you need to explain to somebody who speaks Japanese, and they want it not just in yen, but in Japanese number format, and now your brain has turned to soup because that's too many things to do at once. So this is just a little app built in Coda where you say how many dollars you have, you uh, pick the day rate, Coda's going to uh, pick the date, Coda's going to go pull the exchange rate for that date, it's going to tell you how much it is in dollars, uh, sorry, in yen, and then it's going to do a little bit of witchcraft to do this impossible bit for you so that you know um, what to say. And now that you know a little bit about how Coda works, uh, hang on, let me walk to that. I can't see because it's hard, but it's big, I can't see all my buttons. Uh, now that you know a little bit of how Coda works, you can start to see. Uh, uh, sorry, I can't see this. You can start to see a little bit of how it's working. So this is saying, hey, go get that value of US dollars that the person just typed in, multiply by the exchange rate, because that's how you do a conversion. Then we're going to wrap it in this little wrapper that says, hey, spit it back out to me in a nice thing that does yen properly. Uh, stuff like that is very straightforward. Interestingly, this bit is a nightmare however you try and do it. And so this is a little bit more number soup to get that to work. But if you weren't trying to do this nightmare thing, that would work a lot better. Um, it's also really great for games. Uh, this is a little work in progress thing that I'm messing around with at the moment. Uh, this is a turn-based card game uh, that you play with the assistance of ChatGPT. So the way this game works is you tell uh, ChatGPT uh, what kind of hero, hero you are. Uh, it looks like I told it I was a venomous barista for this playthrough. Uh, ChatGPT then generates a deck of cards for you with attacks that suit that character. Uh, so I've got these down here, these are the cards uh, and the attacks that I have. Um, ChatGPT then also figures out who you're fighting, which right now seems to be the Dreadful Dishwasher of Doom. And then I can spend my energy to play these cards. Uh, let's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's do a caffeine rush, that sounds like a good idea move. Hmm? Just constant and beginning. <laughs> So I've played that card, uh, and now I've made the dishwasher doom tremble in fear. My caffeine rush has caused it to jitter and stumble and reduce its damage output, that's cool. Uh, and do all the damage and spell this on wrong for how much damage it's lost, but sometimes that's how chat GPT works. So this is obviously a much more complicated build. Um, but again, as somebody who is not a programmer, 
it was unbelievably cool that I could get this stood up and working um, in an environment, um, in a digital environment uh, as easily as I could. Uh, so that's my white mature of all the stuff that I do. Um, I wanted to just kind of say a few things about, uh, I hope what I've done is illustrate that this stuff is, is worth doing and it's within reach. You do need to be a little bit smart about how you do it. I have rabbit holed in some prototypes in my time, and if you're not careful, you can end up spending too much time building a bad, weird version of a thing in an unsuitable tool without the right kind of help. Um, these are the tools I use. Um, they're fun to check out, but they're not necessarily the tools that are right for you. I think how I've ended up with a lot of these tools is learning the potential of things that I'm already familiar with. So I'm not burning a bunch of energy endlessly learning new tools and getting really good at working with what I have. It's definitely how I got really good at using Excel to do weird stuff. It's definitely what I'm doing now with Coda. Um, so the, the, there's a, an aphorism that the best tool for the job is always whatever tool you have with you. That is better than any tool that you don't have with you. So um, I think one of the things I would encourage you to do is look around at what you're using already and see if there's ways that you can get more out of it. Uh, don't feel like you need to prototype your whole idea at once. Often we saw for that the crafting system, for that RPG I was working on, um, often what you can do is split out little individual components of the thing that you're interested in um, and just figure out how to prototype that bit on it so that you will learn something valuable about it that you can feed into the main design. Uh, you don't necessarily need to get a prototype working completely in just one of these tools. Mine are endlessly Frankenstein together. They'll be a little bit that's digital, but I'm also using some dice uh, in the real world, and another thing over here, and then there's a bit that I have to tell you out loud because I haven't figured out how to code that yet. Uh, and that is because this last rule is going to be important rule. It isn't even keep it simple, stupid, it's keep it stupid, stupid. Don't let this thing turn into a real product job. This is about quick and dirty prototyping. Ugly is beautiful. It doesn't matter if the whole thing is bolted together and you feel a little bit silly presenting it to people. Um, it's about getting insights fast. Um, and prioritizing making those insights interactive. Um, and so I thought if I was going to tell all of you that that was a good idea, I would have to live up to it a little bit. At the bottom of your screen, it says don't press this arrow. Uh, if you feel brave, you are allowed to press the arrow. Uh, it will unveil. I kind of made a game, I kind of made a prototype uh, for today. Uh, so what I'm really hoping is at the very bottom of your screen, you can now see an interface that has a button that says join the game, but I'm now already, rather than prototyping, regretting not putting the readout on, on my screen so I can see how many of you join, but I didn't think to do that, so I can't do that. Does everyone have a join the game button? Is everyone in a team? Can I see some hands up from Team Tiger? Woo! Woo! I see some hands up for Team Dragon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's kind of interesting. Um, I had a little feeling that you guys were going to like pressing buttons to make things go up and pressing buttons to make things go down. Uh, so when I built, when I, I, I figured out the way I was going to spend code to was building that little button tool. I thought, I wonder if I can turn this into something a little bit more fun. So, Tigers, your job is to try and turn this whole bar orange to match your team color. Dragon, your team's job is to try and turn the whole team green. You have a button that you can't press yet with your team's name on it that's going to make it move in one direction or the other. This has got really misaligned. Never mind. Um, when one team manages to fill the bar with that color, they win and they get first crack at the drinks and snacks. So, uh, get serious. Um, but, I used to be a free to play games on there, so I thought I would monetize this a little bit. Um, <laughs> there are power-ups available. Uh, there's a booster power-up. Uh, that is going to double all of your team's points for 30 seconds. Uh, that's, that one costs 100 yen. Uh, there's a blocker power-up that disables your opponent's button for 10 agonizing seconds. That's 200 yen. Um, and there's a permanent upgrade. Uh, this is Lucky Day, 
Uh, this doesn't have a timer on it, and every time you click, there's a 1% chance you're going to get a 25x button. Uh, any proceeds that end up in these cups uh, will go direct to Save the Children, so it's for a good cause. Um, no one has ever played this at scale before, so <laughs> I have no real idea what's about to happen. Um, but what I'm hoping that in a second, I'm going to press this enable game button, and then some amount of chaos is going to ensue. Okay. So, everyone feeling ready? I'm going to press this button and pray that the are prototyping that everything works. Three, two, one, go! Oh, there's action! There's action! The, the button is, of course, fluctuating more in the middle. Oh, the dragon! Oh, the dragons are holding on! Does anyone know? Oh, 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 I can't, I can't. I think, I think I've done it. I think two wonderful things have happened. I think Team Tiger has triumphed. Round of applause for Team Tiger. Uh, and prototyping has proved incredibly valuable because I've just realised what's going on that's causing that to not update in the real time. So, that was. Nobody put their hands in their interested in That's a design lesson for me. Nobody cool. thought those were tempting enough. Nobody was properly incentivized. Uh, that was my little effort to put my money in the room makers. So thank you for playing. Thank you. Yeah, so you don't have an answer to this, it's totally fine, but I don't have a strong coding background, just a little bit, mm -hmm. but I'm most interested in the storytelling aspect of games, so I was curious what kind of things could I do to develop a portfolio that would um, be interesting to companies like game companies? Mm -hmm. like, would it be submitting short stories that I've written or adapting those to some kind of like text-based game? Like you mentioned Twine is a lot of text-based games, so mm -hmm. what would be your recommendation for that? I think if, if you're looking at getting hard as a narrative designer, First of all, Optus, I can tell you some good people to follow on Twitter. Um, it's worth stopping and thinking about what all the different kinds of writing jobs there are in a video game. Uh, and most of them aren't actually stories. So, and most of the storytelling, the crafting of kind of like the overall plot or the world building is likely to be being done by the most senior people on the team, so it's the hardest to get started in. So a lot of what writers are doing at the beginnings of their career are they're writing sub rests, uh, they're writing NPC dialogue, they're writing main character arcs, how fast can you 50 variations of loading, reloading, need ammo. Uh, they're writing, I think, for instance, the, the, the bungee, yes, the bungee writing test used to be gun names, uh, writing 20 good gun names, part of his end. Um, and so I think when game companies are interviewing, one of the things they're just trying to understand is, are you somebody who understands what writing for video games is like? Because I think what they get is lots and lots and lots of novellas that people send in of like their dream sci-fi environment, and that's not really what the job is. So communicating that you understand what is needed is a really, really big benefit. And then, yeah, then I think samples are really valuable. Uh, if you can kind of show that you have some capabilities across those different fields. My experience with game companies hiring is that genuinely, they're generally more interested in just your output ability than your education or your career. If, if they are confident that they can hire you and get work out of you that they can use in the game, then they don't really care where you came from. So uh, I think it is always possible to make that move. It is pretty competitive, so it's a, it's a tough field, but I think that definitely kind of gives you a leg up. Uh, making interactive stuff is possibly interesting, but it, again, it also depends a little bit on the kind of companies you want to apply for. You know, big company, as a writer, you're not necessarily designing a lot of those like decision and interaction points. That's going to come from the game design team. So if I was hiring a writer on a big project, I wouldn't necessarily be looking for any particular skills there. It would be more just about the actual quality of the output. But I'll give you trade points for people who are more experienced than I am, so they can tell you more. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you for your presentation. Yeah, I was just wondering if 
could you give us some examples of the problems that you're hired to solve? Okay. Not not specifics, like obviously because it's probably NDAs and stuff. Yeah. But just like what? Why do people want you on their team? Yeah. Um, there's often all kinds of reasons. So sometimes it can be something more like uh, there's a team that's trying to there's a big game that's trying to figure out whether or not they should delay a release. So the game isn't done. They're supposed to be done in six months. They know that under the current plan, they're not going to be done in six months. What they're looking for is an outside assessment of what their design options are. Like, okay, if we did try and finish it in six months, what would be cut? What would be, um, how, how could we still have a coherent game experience if we took a bunch of things out versus what would we get if we kind of decided to delay? Um, sometimes it'll be for a specific design element that that studio hasn't done before. So I've worked a lot of free place for a lot of monetization design and economy balance work. So you maybe have a team that's awesome at making premium video games, but they don't have any experience of designing good, good monetization <laughs> ones, uh, or figuring out how to balance the game economy. Um, sometimes it's a company that is moving into games and hasn't really started making games yet, so they're coming um, as it is a different kind of platform, but they're interested in bringing playful experiences into their space, so they're looking for uh, someone from a games like that who can help them figure out what that is. So those are some of the kinds of situations that um, I've worked with. Uh, but I think there's enough for everyone. So thank you so much for your patience. Uh,